Buon pomeriggio. Oggi nella Biennale Tecnologia ho il grande piacere di poter presentare Gunther Pauli, che oltre a essere un grande amico è, per chi lo, non lo conosce, un grande innovatore, conosciuto a livello mondiale. E innovatore nel senso, non nel, nel termine solito, di pensare un innovatore, cambiare tecnologia o cambiare eh, delle eh, situazioni tecnologiche, ma è una, un innovatore per implementare una società e un'industria che possono rispondere alle necessità delle persone, però utilizzando quanto eh, fa la natura per poter, essere, eh, per poter vivere. Quindi è una visione decisamente diversa dalle solite visioni che hanno, i soliti approcci che hanno le industrie o le imprese, che guardano sempre al pro e al contro. Gunther Paoli guarda al meglio, quindi non produzioni che vadano a migliorare dei livelli di efficienza, ma che lavorino a livello globale e con i prezzi più bassi. È invece una impresa che guarda a essere resiliente e in questo periodo eh, ne vediamo la necessità, eh, in questi periodi terribili di non poter eh, uscire, che risponde alle esigenze collettive, quindi alla necessità non solo di eh, una ristretta cerchia di persone, ma a una società e che eh, utilizzi le risorse locali. Vedete che è un approccio di tipo innovativo che è proprio sull'obiettivo da, da raggiungere. E questo obiettivo da raggiungere, Gunther se l'è eh, guadagnato nel tempo, perché ha fondato nel 1994 una rete di eh, scienziati e di eh, ricercatori che eh, affrontino la possibilità di applicare dei nuovi processi produttivi a impatto zero. Quindi è esattamente quello che fa la natura, che non, pur nella sua vita, per la sua vita, non genera degli scarti, ma servono a qualche di un altro. Voglio essere breve, vi voglio soltanto dare delle indicazioni per quanto riguarda eh, dei libri che forse vi farà piacere approfondire eh, dopo aver sentito il il coinvolgimento emozionale che Gunther riesce sempre a dare. Cioè eh, potete trovare dei eh, suoi libri, gli ultimi, i più recenti, se è, Econ è Economia Blu, oppure Economia in 3D, l'intelligenza della natura, e un altro <coughs> libro che apparirà eh, prossimamente nel prossimo anno, nel 2021, Economia della felicità. Ci sono però anche altre pubblicazioni che io ritengo estremamente interessanti perché il Gunther si riesce a interessare, a creare una visione diversa anche ai bambini. Quindi ha creato ben 365 favole in cui in una storia semplice riesce a eh, incrociare, a mettere la conoscenza scientifica, l'intelligenza emotiva, un'espressività artistica e anche comprensione, un comprensione di sistemi complessi, quello che è esattamente eh, la natura. Io adesso mi taccio perché eh, non voglio sottrarre del tempo a, a, a Gunther e mi farò vivo alla fine se ci saranno delle domande. A te, Gunther. Uh, thank you so much. Molte grazie, Gino. Um, uh, it, it, it's always a great pleasure to be with you on the platform and uh, especially also for my friends and, uh, if I may say, my colleagues at the, the Politecnico di Torino. Um, I have... Uh, uh, really a chance to look back at uh, so many years and, and we could nearly say a couple decades of collaboration with the Politecnico di Torino and, and that gives me, uh, you know, the energy and the desire uh, to be up at one o'clock in the morning to be able to spend this time with you. I'm in Japan, 
as you can perhaps see from the background, uh, you see that uh, I have this uh, wonderful wall painting behind me. And um, yes, I'm speaking to you from Japan, uh, where I have, uh, uh, you know, since 1994, our main office. I think it is important uh, to, to thank you, Gino, for making these efforts and, and for the introduction, because you touched upon two very key points. The first one is that uh, business models and technology must be inspired by the principles that nature applies. And, and I think this is key. Now, what are the principles that nature applies? Um, this is something that very often we forget when we talk about uh, the biomimicry, the biomimetism, what are the unique features of a business in nature? And, and let me just summarize you three of the points, because if I go through all the details, we're gone till tomorrow morning, six o'clock, and, and I do like to have a little sleep in the night. The first one is that in nature, everyone always contributes to the best of their abilities. Now, what does it mean? That means that ecosystems do not know the concept of unemployment. This is very interesting. I mean, everyone always contributes to the best of their abilities in the ecosystem where they are thriving. That is, to me, one of the most important things. Never, ever does nature do what we have done today with the confinement, meaning to immobilize everyone and to generalize even unemployment for the desire of, yes, a very humanitarian and a very correct decision to find ways to protect the lives of people. But in nature, one does that without immobilizing everyone. Everyone is always contributing to the best of their abilities. That is a very first principle. And it's a principle that I think we need to embrace uh, because it does mean, if we translate it into very blunt economic terms, that means that you always have full employment in an ecosystem. The second uh, principle that nature always applies is that it will use whatever is locally available first. Now, that doesn't mean that nothing comes from the outside. I mean, there are migratory birds and there may be dust storms and when there are typhoons, it allows nature to get the best from the bottom of the sea and make it available what hasn't been available before. But the guiding principle is you use what you have. It's a very powerful principle because if you use what you have, you're going to develop an innovation strategy that will allow you to get more out of the available resources in a very creative way, but also in a cascading way. I mean, let me give you a very concrete example. In nature, it is for any uh, region with uh, four seasons, it is normal that the trees lose their leaves. Now, there is not one tree that ever tried to keep the leaves uh, that fall down in the fall to reattach them in the spring. It doesn't make sense. And we know this doesn't make sense. But it's exactly what we've been asking industry to do with the closed loop recycling. We want uh, very simply glass bottles to be converted into glass bottles. We want pet bottles to become pet bottles. And natural systems never have that kind of a logic natural system will always cluster and will always search for a complex way of interconnecting with other things. And we know how a tree operates. The leaves in the fall become a humus thanks to the earthworms, the mushrooms, the microorganisms. They are all contributing by getting the best out of those leaves for their own benefit while doing great things for the next cycle to take place. So the first one is everyone contributes to the best of their abilities and therefore nature has a very deliberate and well thought through social program 
Second, we always use what is local available, meaning that there is never going to be any waste accumulating and disturbing the balance of the system. But there is a third principle, which is very interesting. No one cheats. I mean, this is amazing. Everyone plays according to the rules of the game. Now, the rules of the game have different levels of application. The first ones are the ones that are very carefully adhered to, and I would call it the constitution of nature. The constitution of nature is pulled together by the laws of physics. I mean, it is very clear that talking again about the apples and the trees, it is very clear that an apple always goes against the law of gravity. Interesting. But how can it go against the law of gravity? Because it has learned how to use seven other laws of physics to go against gravity. And even if this uh, would sound like a permanent motion that is uh, permitting apples to go up and down, up and down and up and down, it is a wonderful demonstration how there are core constitutional rules of nature established to which everyone plays in detail and one of those is the law of gravity but another one is capillary forces and i think it is very important to realize that none of these basic laws of physics are ever neglected by anyone they're always used in combination they're always used in in coordination in coherence and as a result you never have anyone cheating the laws of physics it is an amazing constatation that we when we design principles for business i'm not saying that we're teaching everyone to cheat but we are always very carefully of neglecting that we as human beings part of nature will also have to adhere to these core principles the constitution of nature what i call the laws of physics now we know that we haven't yet fully understood the laws of physics we do not very well understand how quantum physics uh, can be integrated with nuclear physics and and so humanity must have the humility to accept that we are in need of adjusting our industrial development policies our economic development policies our innovation policies to be in line with the hard reality that we still do not very well know how nature works now if you do not know how nature really works shouldn't we first and foremost study how it works and this is a very different position than when we are embracing genetic modifications or we are unleashing the creativity of chemical engineers in order to design new molecules because when we are designing new molecules or we're designing uh, new combinations of dna we are forgetting that very often these two new forms of of uh, matter and and life on earth are actually not necessarily following the rules of the game the constitution of nature and i think this is where we have to make a very important decision when we are looking at technology we have to humanize technology we have to have the heart and we have to have our soul our tradition our resilience our community also at the core but at the same time we need to insert a very clear element of ethics into the equation and it's clear that business as usual has not included the ethics and has not included the laws of physics and this is why i think that so often our industrial processes have run counter to life now running counter to life is not possible but we know that we have been destroying biodiversity at unprecedented rates 
Um, so when we are not promoting life, but when we realize that our production and consumption model destroys life, we have to come to terms that a new approach is necessary. Now, that new approach should first and foremost understand how life on Earth is functioning. And this is, uh, uh, thank you, Gino, for referring to my fables, but this is one of the key reasons why I started writing the fables. The fables allow us to put the finger on so much of the knowledge that should be obvious, and yet we realize that no one really knows it. We just haven't asked the question. That doesn't mean there is no expert anywhere in the world who doesn't know the answers. The problem is that what seems to be so obvious for life is not obvious for us. Give me an example. I'll give you an example. When we are thinking about our lungs, our lungs uh, have these uh, incredible opportunity to be in touch with blood. And the blood is very carefully distributed through our lungs and it allows the lungs to take out the CO2 and to put in the oxygen. Now, I don't know if you realize, but every day, if you look at the total volume of blood going through our lungs, that equals five tons a day. Five tons a day. Five tons of blood a day is going through our lungs and is making it possible to have this incredible exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide, which is, of course, a precondition for our life. Now, let's think as a lung and let's think as blood. What about now applying the principles of the lung to eliminate microplastics from the ocean? Now, I'm, I, I'm not discussing plastics at the moment. I'm just saying we know we have this incredible amount of microplastics in the ocean and we know that there is a need to clean the oceans of these microplastics, but the challenge is so vast that most of us have not even dared to think about it. Of course, we have some great initiatives to have biodegradable plastics, and we have great initiatives to take the big pieces of plastics out of the ocean, but we have no real plan to clean the oceans of the billions of microplastics we have per cubic hectare in our oceans. So when you look at all the technologies one can consider, it is most likely impossible to imagine one that will allow you to dream of the fact that we can clean up the oceans. But if you start creating the links between how our lungs are being cleansed and our lungs are able to have blood at the rate of five tons without with a pressure that is not even 0 0.2 bar so we're talking about a very light pressure we're talking about a five ton volume and that is just our lungs if we apply the principles of the lungs to the cleanup of the oceans then we know that you can insert the functionality of a lung on a CD. And if you have it on a CD with the kind of micro fluids going through as it goes through our lung, then we see the opportunity to start cleansing the oceans. Now, that to me is the way we have to start thinking about solutions. I am, I am not here um, discussing uh, the, the, the new form of the internet. Uh, I'm not discussing uh, the genetics and the chemicals. I'm just saying that there are some core priorities we have to focus on. And if we are able to manage microfluids the same way as we have managed uh, ourselves in our lungs, and as the whales are doing it, 
and as any mammal is doing it breathing then we see opportunities for a completely different approach to the cleanup of the oceans now we we have to realize and here i draw a parallel that microelectronics have since the 1980s had a pervasive impact on our lives the integration of microelectronics with communications became a complete transition in the way that we have communicated, the way that we have processed data, the way that we have accumulated data and mined data. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to see exactly the same with microfluids. Microfluids are going to completely change the way we look at the opportunities to both cleanse the world from the errors of the past as well as imagine solutions for the future we can with microfluids finally clean up the antibiotics that we have uh, unintentionally been dispersing into aquat environment aqua aqua environments, water environments for several decades. We will see opportunities, though, at the same time to make pharmaceuticals tailored to individuals thanks to microfluids. And, and that's exactly what our immune system is doing. So I think that microelectronics had a major impact in, in our society and in our lives. And I think we're going to see exactly the same breakthrough with microfluids and microfluids will be joining in with other mainstream industries that are in the end of the day transforming or at least giving the opportunity to transform society for a much better world so i think uh gino in in your introduction you very rightly insisted on one of the core principles is being inspired by nature. The microfluids is perhaps one of the most efficient uh, components of the way our body works. And somehow industry has been looking at big pipes with high pressures in order to get uh, the job done. And now we're seeing that as the channels of the fluids get smaller and smaller, the efficiency of the whole operation increases exponentially. This is the kind of laws of efficiency that we have seen in microelectronics, in data processing, where we have been saying that every year we will double the capacity of our uh, memories, we will double the capacity of our speed of communications and it is very clear that this has to be at the service of humanity and nature it is not enough to be at service of humanity we also have to be of service to nature but when we realize that microplastics today 80 percent of the microplastics that we're struggling with are suspended in the air and 20 percent are in the water but the 20 percent in the water is creating a devastating and destructive environment for the very simple reason that chemical engineers for the past 50 years have never been trained to design plastics that degrade in the sun in the soil and in the sea isn't it amazing that plastics bioplastics means that it is degradable in the soil with microorganisms in the soil but it doesn't take a chemical engineer or a biologist to realize that the degradation of something that functions in the soil is operating with microorganisms that are totally different from the microorganisms we find into the sea and the european commission which pride itself so often of being you know the forefather and the precursor of uh, environmental policies even today there is no european standard for what is a biodegradable plastic in the sea there's no standard and there's no one really learning how to do it in all three environments so in order to move forward 
I think we need the government to create those standards urgently, and Europe should do that urgently. And Italy, which has been a leader in the polymer industry for, for decades, uh, Italy has been at the forefront of that, and today is in the forefront of bioplastics and its multiple applications. Italy should be leading uh, the definition and the the normalization of uh, the the biodegradation in the ocean. But that should also be accompanied by the new technologies to clean up the oceans. I think this is a, a, a very important component. Now, let me just uh, take you to a next uh, small example. And here you have uh, a little cell, a, a little leaf. Um, unfortunately, maybe the light is not uh, as good as we would expect it, but I can see very well that the blue light is still on. Now, this is the blue light is a light that is generated by this leaf. And as you can see very well, this is a plastic leaf. Well, not exactly a plastic leaf. Inside, you have seaweed cells. Now, here's a very interesting um, element that we are urgently needing in terms of efficiency of energy. We know that uh, we need an energy transition and one of the great difficulties we have been facing the last uh, few decades is that whenever we have sun, we got power. Whenever there is wind, we have power. But when there is no sun or wind, we don't have power. It means that we have not been able to have renewable energies in a constant supply of baseload power. Now, baseload power is what the nuclear energy, what the... the coal uh, coal fire power stations uh, offer us and therefore we are in a kind of a desperate need to develop as soon as possible new sources of energy that indeed will be solar and wind but that that become baseload and very often we are stuck with parameters of the past i give you the example of this one here the the present technique of calculating the efficiency of a solar cell is that we calculate per square meter how much power do you generate per square meter and fair enough that is a good parameter but not the only parameter here you have a solar cell which is basically made by seaweeds now we know very well that seaweeds have this incredible capacity even at 20 25 meters deep in this in the ocean where there is not much sun they can still capture the sun and they will still have their photosynthesis operating so this little cell is able to generate power where no photovoltaic panel would ever get power so if you're calculating this solely on the basis of the sun light converted to electricity then this is only 15 percent as efficient as a photovoltaic cell but if you're calculating how much power this little leaf this thin film and flexible one is generating then over a whole day because the moment the sun comes up the algae are capturing the light and converting it through photosynthesis then you're at about 50 percent of the power of a photovoltaic cell but now comes the interesting catch if you're calculating how much electricity solar cells made with algae can generate per kilogram of material then this is 10 times more efficient than the photovoltaics we know today. Now, to me, this is where we are in need of getting out of our, what I would call our straitjackets. We need to get out of the logic that we have been applying from for the past uh, decades. We need to be able to say that it is possible to have different parameters to measure, because what is very clear 
that if you have a very light uh, film that you can roll on your roof, you don't have to worry about the structural requirements for 300 kilograms of uh, solar cells put on a roof per square meter because with this little film you can roll it out anywhere anytime and the great advantage is that it will generate power from the moment the light is there we are observing over the past 25 years that we've been able to work with these thousands of incredible scientists who are always contributing with new ideas we're observing that continuously the greatest innovations are actually not innovations they are rather what i call discoveries we discover that the sea has this capacity to do photosynthesis with algae at a point where we would hardly have light in front of us and yet they're able to convert that into a blunt energy source that by the way creates the fastest growing plants on earth because the kelp grows even twice as fast as bamboo kelp in the sea grows twice as fast as bamboo and of course it's very obvious they can do it because they don't have to worry about gravity and therefore their capacity to convert nutrients into a structural form is very interesting. Now, Gino, you mentioned in the beginning that the first basic principle is inspired by nature. The second one is that we have to work with what is locally available. Now, let me give that uh, an upfront, uh, very straightforward introduction on a broader scale. I am not against globalization. I am not against free trade. I am not in favor of autarky. But we have to realize that after 50 years of relentless drive towards a free trade, globalization, economies of scale, outsourcing, supply chain management, logistic centers, we have to realize that we have not been able to respond to the basic needs of a growing population. Now, immediately, and as a member of the Club of Rome, I recognize that immediately there can be a very hot debate about how we are stopping population growth. Because the logic is very clear. You stop the population growth, you will stop exploiting the earth. But even when we were at 2 million or 4 million, 4 billion inhabitants in the world, we were already overexploiting the earth. The earth has clearly come to limits. And when you are going beyond your limits, then it is necessary that you question how is my growth model, my development model to be transformed. And you heard me say, how do we need to transform it i'm not saying that we have to go for degrowth there are other people who are arguing for degrowth in order to put the right balance into the economy but i am arguing for a very fundamental shift in the business model the economic model the management model so both at the macroeconomic level and at the microeconomic level i am arguing for a fundamental shift towards a more humane, a more in harmony with nature approach. Here again, though, permit me to insist up front that a human approach means also an ethical approach. I'm not here to preach. I'm not here to say that we have to integrate um, very strict religious principles in our business models. I'm saying that there are certain ethical principles that everyone will immediately agree upon. And one of those ethical principles, uh, I would say, is stealing less is stealing. Polluting less is polluting. You cannot say that you're doing a great job by polluting less. You can only not pollute. That's the only standard we could have. So the ethical question of our business models is that we have taken it for granted 
that we can pollute what is called the commons. We can pollute the air, the soil and the water. And we do that freely. And since I am making money and I am more efficient by doing it, I turn that into a right that I have. And that right is the same right for anyone else. But if everyone is taking the same right, then we have what has been called the demise of the commons. The commons is what is really bringing all of us together in the world with a quality of life. And that human aspect of respecting the quality of life, of promoting life as a core principle of being here on this earth, that needs to be translated into a macroeconomic model. Now, the macroeconomic model we have today does not permit us to promote life. Because if you are to compete globally based on being the cheapest, then there is no other way than to cut corners. There's no other way that you will not have the best social program for your workers. There is no way that you can compete against the Bangladeshis and the Chinese and the Brazilians by regenerating your ecosystem. And, and I think very few people have realized that when you have an economic model where money circulates in cyberspace, that means it's not anymore in the local economy. And when products are manufactured on the basis of being the cheapest as a model for competition, in those circumstances, you are promoting unemployment, loss of biodiversity, and I would even dare to say the majority of the sustainable development goals can never be achieved. Now, how do we get out of that straitjacket? Because if we are within an economic system that is so entrenched into this logic of global competition based on price, and in order to get to the lower price, you are focusing on economies of scale, producing more of the same at always lower marginal costs. Well, again, here I go back to how does nature do it? I mean, nature has been uh, operating for a couple billion years and, and nature has always very successfully overcome the worst of its crisis. And, and, and yes, there have been losses of biodiversity before, but for the first time, this loss of biodiversity is created by us. So let us be honest and look reality in the eye and say that if we have not succeeded over the past 50 years in reversing the reality, then we must change the hypotheses on the basis of which we're operating. I mean, this is a scientific approach. If your results don't change working within very clearly defined hypotheses, then you must change your hypotheses. And the hypothesis for me is very clearly that we cannot continue to build competitive models with employment generation and with regeneration of nature unless we change the competitive model based on this ever lower pricing. Now, some arguments uh, will be advanced immediately saying that, uh, okay, if you are able, if you are not able to compete on price um, and you are charging more money from everyone, then you will reduce the purchasing power and that means you will also be in poverty. Well, that argument is correct as long as you stay within the same hypothesis. But if you change the hypothesis, that is not correct anymore. And what is the new hypothesis? The new hypothesis is indeed that you're not operating as a core business with a core competence on the basis of economies of scale, but that you are operating as a cluster whereby you are creating feedback loops and connections amongst the different players on the market so that you generate what economists know as the multiplier effect. But it means the cash has to be taken out of cyberspace and back into the local economy. Because if you're keeping taking cash out of these local economies, then you will have villages and towns and communities that will run dry. 
run dry means that the economy basically comes to a halt the most dynamic people will leave and in the end of the day the few that are left are going to offer a house for one euro in order to get some life back this is not the way forward in the discussions i had uh, with uh, the italian government uh, leadership in the government it has been very clear that while there is a lot of sympathy for these principles it is very difficult to turn that into a hard concrete policy discussions with the mayor of uh, of milano uh, discussions uh, with uh, economics ministers over the past few years have repeatedly shown that there is a heart and an interest to do it but that in order to get to practice there is a very important factor missing it cannot be mandated from the top down it must be something that is generating a groundswell but that groundswell will be a groundswell of entrepreneurs for the common good these are people who really love their community are committed to their community and these are people who will be doing whatever is within their means to make it happen and there in my concluding remarks i would like to just say that this is very difficult in the present conditions because we have ended up with this COVID situation in what I call the zero risk society. No one is taking risks anymore. And, and when no one is taking risks and everyone is to stay home and, and a test that was for a laboratory is now used to confine a whole nation, uh, even though the snippets you find in those uh, tests uh, need to be magnified uh, 10 to the 37th in order to come to a positive result when we are in the con in this environment whereby we are looking at zero risk it is even more difficult to come to a transition but here is the message that i would like to bring out to all of those who follow this event when everyone is stopping and everyone is in this zero risk mentality. Those who are taking steps forward are the ones who will be shaping the agenda. While governments have to do everything they can to reduce the risk and to protect public health, at the same time, we need to have a countervailing force. And that countervailing force is the one that is ready to move forward on the obvious agendas that we can implement. In the month of uh, July and August, in the period of uh, the COVID uh, uh, lockdown in France, I had the privilege of visiting 12 cities in 15 days, meeting with mayors, meeting with elected officials, meeting with uh, local entrepreneurs, meeting with the NGOs, the civil society, and, and after having exchanged and consulted uh, through more than uh, 48 meetings uh, in nothing less than 15 days, um, I, I had the opportunity to interact and listen to more than 10,000 people. And what was very clear is that what we need to do in order to come out of this society of zero risk is that we need to bring portfolios of opportunities to the forefront. I was privileged to be invited uh, by the mayor of, uh, of, um, of um, uh, uh, I was privileged to be invited uh, uh, by the mayor of Capri. And uh, when I was in Capri and I walked through the village, I saw that the coat of arms of uh, Capri, of course, is a goat. And I said, and where are you goats? And of course, uh, over the years, goats have been eliminated. Now, if we want to do something, we have to look at what is locally available. But one swallow doesn't announce the spring. You need to have portfolios of these opportunities. And again, this is where we need to have a very clear inspirational activity. 
We need to inspire young people with a series of very concrete initiatives that we all see right in front of us. And since we see it in front of us and there is an exposure of these opportunities to a good group of citizens, there is nothing you can do about it, but initiatives will be taken even if it is a zero risk society. And those who will take the initiatives at that moment will be the ones who have the opportunity to move and transform society. What I'm basically saying is that, yes, we have a lot of technologies on hand. And yes, we can be inspired by nature. And yes, the ethics have to be included. And yes, we need to change the macro and the microeconomic model. But all of that is without any use, without any use, unless we inspire a new generation of entrepreneurs. The greatest scarcity we have is not raw materials. The greatest scarcity is not money. The great scarcity is not political leadership. The greatest scarcity is a lack of young entrepreneurs for the common good who are willing to take the initiatives. And whatever we're discussing will be without any results unless we make an extraordinary effort, not to finance and provide a lot of money for entrepreneurs, but to inspire the people that indeed all these grand opportunities we have right before us and that are all fitting into this model of creating resilience and not just efficiency and responding to the needs of society and regenerating nature. All of that requires people who just pull up their sleeves and say, we're going to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, um, it, 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 it is to me, uh, you know, a kind of a life dream that after this real tough lockdown we will be able to be given a degree of freedom to focus on the generation on the creation of a new generation on the inspiration of a new generation of entrepreneurs these are not the people who are the experts in excel spreadsheets these are people who get going even without having written a business plan these are people that are going because the opportunity is so obvious before them that they will automatically proceed with it. And I think this is what is really so important. When we have a business model that is taught at business schools and leads you to the MBAs to all be risk averse and have done the detailed calculations, ladies and gentlemen, we have no time to lose. We cannot have a burn rate of two, three, four, five years before something concrete is happening in our societies. We need to not only have a portfolio of opportunities, we need to have entrepreneurs, a new generation of entrepreneurs who see that quite a few of these opportunities can be implemented in no time. That means in weeks, in months, we're having a positive cash flow. And that is something that is very important. We need to have the culture of starting immediately. I'm saying that we have to be impatient to get started and maybe patient to get results. But if you're smart in the identification of how you can operate as a cluster with different activities together, then there will be a transformation in society with job generation and the generation of value that is so high that actually it is possible to generate multiple cash flows, have multiple benefits, and then we will have the transformation of society as we are hoping for. Thank you very much. Uh, Gunther, uh, io, ti Parlo per, italiano, eh, Tino. Sì, ok. <laughs> ti Beh, ringrazio ti tantissimo. Tutto. Sì. Ti ringrazio tantissimo per uh, questa energia che hai dato, questa, <ride> questa iniezione di, di energia. Vorrei farti una domanda che forse può essere utile per tutti quanti, per portare ancora più sul pratico le cose. Su, cosa, e su quali progetti, visto che all'inizio non ho potuto parlare dei oltre 200 progetti che hai implementato in giro per il mondo e <ride> nei vari continenti, su quali, quali sono i tuoi ultimi progetti che magari danno una visione più eh, pratica anche.
che quindi vedono come questi pensieri possono trasformarsi in una realtà. Abbiamo circa una, una decina di minuti, quindi io penso che con questa domanda si possono riassumere diverse dubbi, diverse interpretazioni, perché per non andare sulle discussioni dei principi, secondo me partire su un ambito specifico e pratico so che a te piace molto e piacerà anche a tutti gli ascoltatori. Prego. Well, uh, thank you Gino. Let, let me just take this as an example. I mean, basically, um, Gino, you know that um, I have been fighting for 25 years to have energy systems without batteries. And, and, and for the first time, I see how we can use a very small little uh, leaf and how we can transform this little leaf into a, a, a very basic source of energy where we eliminate all types of batteries that have invaded our lives. But there is something else, you know, I have been saying no to batteries because if we're using too many batteries as we're doing today we're mining more lithium and we're mining more metals and that means we're exploiting more the earth and we are exploiting the miners and we are unfortunately also putting scars into the earth so then the second thing is that you know i'm very keen on a new internet i'm very keen on a new way of transmitting data and this little lead lamp that we have here this little lead lamp is actually going to be equipped with a li-fi chip that means that i'm going to be able to wear this and it can take another form but i'm going to wear this and on here will be written uh gunter pauli permitted to enter room number seven and so with the light that is above me and this little lead that is powered by this little cell from the seaweeds that little lead is going to tell to any light i'm walking under i'm on my way to room number seven and so this is instead of the qr codes this is instead of a wi-fi code this is a very simple way of being able to transmit i am here and when the little lamp is saying i am here then i am traced like a gps so you see what i'm talking about we're eliminating satellites i'm not only talking about eliminating the need for um batteries and mining i'm eliminating the need for satellites and i know that there are going to be 50 to 80 000 satellites put into orbit but i'm saying that if we have a very simple system like this here we will be able to supply the capacity of a gps service at a very low cost and with great efficiency and a precision of the localization that goes beyond what is today available on the market and i think this is what excites me now there is another element uh, gino which is surprising you know, you know where we're putting these first uh, films? Underneath the solar panels. So you have a solar panel, and underneath the solar panel, we'll put the film. And we will increase by 50% the production of energy by putting a film in the shade underneath the panels. Now, this is to demonstrate to you, Gino, use what you have. We know that we can't use a solar panel on both sides because a photovoltaic panel cannot be used on the bottom. But algae, they know how to do that. So I am actually creating this opportunity to have solar panels complemented with solar film. And I can double the production, not double, I can increase by 50% the production of power by using the available space by using a film that is light so i don't have to change the structure you know i always have been arguing use what you have 
And very often people say, oh, I've got waste. No, 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 no. It's not only about having waste. If you have solar panels and your bottom is not being used and you can put this underneath and you can combine it on top of that with a GPS function and you can eliminate the batteries. You see what I'm talking, Gino? This is the way we have to think. This is the new business model. It is not only the technology. It's to use the three-dimensional space that we have around us in a much more efficient way so that we can do as a forest does. Every little square cubic meter, not square meter, every cubic meter is used. And, and this is one of my very big uh, messages I'm bringing out to everyone. How come we stick to a 2D world? I mean, the world that we grow up is 4D. We have the space and the time. That means we're living and growing in 4D and everything we calculate is in 2D. That means you must have forgotten at least a hundred times more opportunities because you have not looked at the 4D. You've looked at the 2D. No, you don't see this unless you're trained like this. And therefore, I would like to commend the Politecnico de Torino and especially uh, you, Gino, and your team uh, with, uh, with Silvia Barbero and others who have all been studying how you can do this in a systems design. I mean, the Politecnico de Torino is leading this worldwide. And you are the first ones to take the design of a product, the design of a process, the graphic design into a system design. And opportunities are only really mastered, understood, when you look at it in a system design way. And look at this. Just by showing this little leaf, I talked about the biomimicry and the understanding of algae in the ocean. By talking about this leaf, we talked about mining. We talked about GPS. We talked about satellites. We talked about the new internet. We talked about extending the load of electricity from a solar panel. All of that in just one leaf. Now, this is the systems approach. This requires system dynamics. This creates feedback loops and opportunities that change the business model. And what is the bottom of this? That we can have an internet that will consume 80% less energy. At a time when the only one sector in the world economy that is rapidly growing in consumption of electricity, we see an opportunity to cut the consumption by 80%. Now, is this a debate about 5G versus Li-Fi? No, this is nothing to see with 5G versus Li-Fi. Those who want to debate 5G versus other technologies have missed the argument. The argument is, are we transforming the economy? Yes or no. And the transformation of the economy without, with a dramatic reduction of the need for batteries and mining, with an opportunity to have more precise GPS functioning with an opportunity to cut energy by 80%. That's the debate we need to have. And that's the opportunity we all should exploit. Grazie, Gunther. Sempre un piacere sentirti. In base alle domande che vedo, ti ringrazio per questo, uh, questa visione molto pratica. Eh, io suggerisco per chi è interessato a vedere altri eh, esempi di realizzazione di eh, leggere il libro Economia in 3D, l'intelligenza della natura. Lì ce ne sono molti, molti, molti altri, quindi secondo me è anche in altro modo. Sono obbligato a, a doverti salutare, ti saluto, un grande abbraccio, con il piacere di averti rivisto e il piacere di aver, eh, tu hai parlato del design sistemico, il piacere di aver con te eh, fondato questa laurea magistrale in design sistemico al Politecnico di Torino, che è l'unica esistente al mondo. Questo è, è un gran piacere eh, ed è un onore per il, non solo per me, ma per il Politecnico tutto.
Grazie Gunther, a presto. Ciao. Un piacere per me. Ciao Gino.